Today is Wednesday, March 25th, in the year of our Lord, 2020. Today we will be talking about Leif Enger's book, Peace Like a River. This is our final book in American literature and takes us up to the 20th century. Let's get started here. Next slide. So we'll talk in about the biography of Leif Enger. There's a picture of the book right there. Then we will also talk about the various characters, the plot, the, and we'll discuss archetypes, and then themes and the nature of faith, which is kind of what the book is about. Leif Enger, he was born in Minnesota in 1961. He met his wife at Moorhead State University. He worked for Minnesota Public Radio for 19 years. He and his brother Lynn wrote mystery novels in the 1990s, but no one read them. His oldest son was suffering from asthma, and in trying to bring that under control, the story of Peace Like a River was born. So he published it in 2001 and won numerous awards. It's a great book. It's a really good book. I enjoy it a whole lot. I hope you will, too. Next slide. So what are the characters in this book? There's Reuben Land, the 11 year old narrator who suffers from asthma. There's Swede Land, that's Reuben's nine year old sister. And what she likes to do is write poetry and interspersed in the book is this poem that kind of parallels what's going on in the other part of the book. So they, it's done very well. Then there's Davy Land, who's the older brother. And Davy Land um, shoots and kills two ruffians who, who have attacked his sister Swede. And for various reasons, he's convicted of murder. And he's before he's sentenced, um, he escapes. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's Jeremiah Land. He's the father. And his claim to fame is that he's a miracle worker. Now, when I say miracle worker, you probably think of somebody like Benny Hinn or something like, someone like that who goes around laying hands on people or doing tricks, that sort of thing. Jeremiah Land, the miracles that he does or pass through him is probably a better way to describe it. They don't come at his command. He doesn't command them to happen, but they simply happen. Whether he does it consciously or anything like that, they simply happen. And so his miracles are odd in that sense. Jeremiah Land at one time was going to be a doctor. He was a medical student. Something stupendous and I would say miraculous happened to him. He gave up going to medical school and he decided to become a school janitor. And that's where we find him in this book. And then there's Roxana Cowley. She's a friend of the Land family. And then there's Jape Walter who is an enigmatic outlaw who helps Davy. In my opinion, Jape Walter is one of the most evil characters in all of literature. Let's go on. Plot. All right, in between his father's miracle, Reuben tells the story of how Davy shoots two ruffians who attack Swede. Uh, Davy's tried, and the night before his sentencing, he escapes. And he escapes and goes into the Badlands of South Dakota. The Land family heads into the Badlands, to find Davy. They receive word that he's there, that he's visited a friend of theirs, and so they decide to go find him. Meanwhile, the federal authorities are looking for Davy as well. Because Davy has crossed state lines, he's now a fugitive, and the federal authorities, the FBI, are looking for him as well. There, in the Badlands of South Dakota, Reuben finds Davy and a lot more. So I want to talk about archetypes for just a few minutes here. Archetype comes from two Greek words, arche, which means head, leader, ruler, principle, and tupos, which means type or shadow or image. So archetypes are these primeval shadows that affect or reflect all the other types, all the other events that follow. So when we're talking about archetypes, we're talking about the root of different things. 
1949, Joseph Campbell published The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And this book was hailed, is now hailed as a classic in literary studies. Campbell believed that all myths and epics are linked in the human psyche. Now, he got this idea from Carl Jung. Carl Jung talked a lot about archetypes. And he, Carl Jung, the psychologist, said that we have these innate ideas in our heads and they simply come out and they manifest themselves in various ways. Campbell got this idea and then he started studying myths uh, and epics across various cultures, especially American Indian culture. And he began to develop this theory. He said he saw a pattern. He asserted that there is a single pattern or archetype of a heroic journey and that all cultures share this essential pattern in their various heroic myths. And that's not the only pattern that there is, but that's the pattern that we're going to talk about today because it reflects what's going on in peace like a river. So whether Campbell is correct or not, and people disagree with him, but his idea provides us with a handy tool and it's just a tool for analyzing peace like a river. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is a simplification of Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces. This is what he says the heroic journey entails. You notice down here, there are the various characters that appear in this. There's the hero, and he's the active character. He's the one that sacrifices and grows. Then there's a mentor, like a wise old wizard, the teacher and gift giver. There's sometimes there's a herald. He issues the challenges or announces the coming change. There's shapeshifters, people that, that aren't what they appear to be. They can mislead the hero. They bring doubt and suspense. There's the threshold guardians. Because this is a journey, you have to cross a threshold. And so there are people or things or events or something that guards this threshold. And so the hero has to get past the threshold guardian. Sometimes the hero meets a trickster, mischief, comic relief. He can be a catalyst or trickster hero. And then there's usually the shadow, the dark side of the villain or the villain. He challenges the hero. So those are some of the characters that are in this archetype that Campbell found. And the story of the heroic journey follows in sort of this pattern right here, begins with separation. The hero begins in an ordinary world, an innocent world, and then he's called to adventure. Sometimes there's a refusal of the call, then he accepts the call, and he meets a mentor. Now, not all of these happen, and there's a talisman. That's some kind of object that's very important. He, he crosses a threshold into the void. So this is where he's initiated into the next phase right here. He crosses this threshold. He finds allies, he finds foes and threshold guardians. Threshold guardians can be helpers, they can be foes, they can be neutral. He travels this road to where he's going. He approaches the inmost cave, he goes through an ordeal, and he gains a reward, either knowledge or seizing of the sword or something else. And then there's the recognition. He travels back to his original world but he's no longer innocent. He knows what's going on. And there's a final battle and a resurrection. And then he returns with the elixir or whatever he's achieved. These things that he's, that he's found here, he brings back with him. And this leads to his recognition. He's seen for who he is. And this is a pattern then that Campbell found in myths. Now, not all of these elements are in there, but sometimes they are. Not all of these um, characters are in there either. Some of them are, some of them are not. There's sometimes there's more than one. So this is a general idea of how this whole thing works. All right, so let's talk about the heroic journey. Campbell's archetype is a pattern that any author may use to his own ends. Here's another um, picture of this. You see there's the call to adventure, Sometimes there's supernatural aid, the threshold guardian. He meets, crosses the threshold. He meets these others people as he faces different challenges. There's the abyss, the death and rebirth. 
And we, where have we seen this before? Well, both Odysseus and Aeneas go down to Hades. There's a transformation, atonement, and then the return. Or it may not be return, it may be reaching the end of his journey. Aeneas goes to Italy. Now, in the Aeneid, Virgil says he's returning because the Trojans originally came from Italy and they went to Troy and then they're coming back. But Odysseus obviously returns. He returns home. So this is how the hero's journey. Now, if you'll compare this with our original slide, the original slide, this is not the, exactly the same thing. But the idea, so this is a variation on that. So, and an author can use these to his own ends. He can use parts of these or all of these. Anger does that. And Reuben is the hero and he's on a journey, but some of the elements don't fit and others are out of sequence. Sometimes the mentor appears earlier, threshold guardians appears earlier, the death and rebirth happens later. And that's the freedom an author has. The goal here with the archetypes is that they're part, they're hooks. And so we have a general idea how the story is supposed to go. And an author can use that. If an author just followed the same pattern over and over again, be like Hardy Boys books, and it would just be the same story over and over again. And it might sell, but it wouldn't be great literature. That's, the, that's a great author. When he takes these elements and he turns them forward to his own ends to tell the, his story the way he wants to tell it. All right. So let's look at the elements here. Anger, consciously or unconsciously, works some of the elements of Campbell's heroic journey into a story. Can we see these? Can we see these elements in other stories? And of course, yes, we can. We can see in the original Star Wars movie where Luke is living on Tatooine, and it's kind of an innocent life. He wants to go and do all he wants to leave, and all of a sudden the droids show up, and they've got the secrets to the Death Star. And then he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, who's like this mentor fellow, and he leads him on, and they go on this long journey. And then as the movies progress, what happens? He meets Darth Vader, who's his enemy and turns out to be his father. And he has to become a Jedi Knight, and he's defeated by Darth Vader, almost defeated by Darth Vader in the second movie where he, where he decides to to let go uh, inside that cloud and almost dies and he's and he's taken back and then he has to come back and defeat Jabba the Hutt and rescue everybody and then they defend, end up defeating the Empire and the Emperor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where that whole journey starts. And that's one reason why the other Star Wars movies aren't any good is because they've lost the archetype. And then we, there's the Harry Potter stories. Now, I'm not that familiar with the Harry Potter stories, but apparently there's, there's, a, you know, there's a mentor, which is Dumbledore, and then Harry has to get various talismans, his wand and the cloak of invisibility, etc., etc. And then there's the Lord of the Rings, where Frodo is living in the Shire, an innocent life, and he inherits the ring from uh, the... Um, yeah, he inherits the ring and then Gandalf leads him and he becomes the Fellowship of the Ring and then they engage with various things like that. Bilbo, he gets it from Bilbo. All right, so that's where these other stories, we see this. Now, these stories resonate with, with us because they echo the archetype. We expect this kind of motion and so it's very useful for us. Um, are there heroic journeys in the Bible? Yes, now, when we talk about the Bible, and the archetype, people get nervous because it sounds like we're saying that there is the archetype of this story and there's all these myths and all of these um, other cultural are, um, manifestations of this archetype and the Bible is simply one of them. So, we, so it's like we're lessening the importance of the Bible. The Bible just becomes another book of myths. But that's not how we should look at it. And that's not how G.K. Chesterton looked at it, nor C.S. Lewis. What Lewis said was that God had placed within the hearts of mankind a story. And he told, and stories were woven into these various cultures. These are mythical stories which aren't true. 
but they prepared people's hearts for when the true story came, when the real history occurred, when the myth entered history and became true myth, he says. Then these people could reach out and hold on to it and say, yes, I understand now. These stories were preparing me. These false stories were preparing me for the true story. Now I appreciate it and I understand it. Otherwise, the story that God told in the gospel, the true story, would have no hooks in these other cultures. And it would have taken a long time for these other cultures to adopt them. But because there were hooks there already, then they were able to grasp the story and believe the gospel. That was Lewis's idea. But the question is, are there heroic journeys in the Bible? And the answer is yes. Look at one right here, David. Uh, first of all, the separation. David is just, you don't even know who he is. He's just the youngest son of Jesse. And all of a sudden, Samuel shows up and anoints him to be king. Bang, he's separated out from his brothers. Then he defeats Goliath. So he's separated from the rest of Israel. And then he joins, this is David, the famous picture of David and Goliath's head with Goliath's sword on his shoulder. Uh, then he becomes part of Saul's household. So we no, lo no longer is he just a member of the army, um, but he's also in the king's household. This is that. And then there's the initiation. What happens? Well, Saul becomes jealous and drives David out. David goes into the wilderness, basically, lives in a cave. He is pursued by Saul. He gains an army. He has to fight battles. He gains a wife. He gains other things. And all of these things are initiation for him. Finally, when Saul is defeated, there is the recognition. Saul, David is made king in Hebron, and then he's king over Israel. And he at near the at, and then at one point he brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. That's the high point of his reign right here. And he establishes this thing. This is what is a heroic journey. This is the conclusion of it. Now, the story that follows this is Bathsheba, and then you have Absalom, and then Solomon comes later. That's kind of a second part of the story. But this is the this part right here, up to this, up to the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant coming to Jerusalem. That is really the end of his journey. He's home now. So he starts as a little boy in, in Bethlehem, and he goes through this journey, and all of a sudden, at the end of the story, he's king in Jerusalem. And that's a heroic journey. And that's how we should understand it. Or rather, that's one way of understanding it, that this is part of these archetypes. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So what are the themes then in Peace Like a River? Well, you have warfare. Jeremiah Land, the father, portrays the struggles he faces in terms of warfare. However, his method of warfare is asymmetric. By asymmetric, I mean he doesn't fight conventionally. His And that's what worries his son, Davy. Davy wants to face the ruffians head on. And Jeremiah says, no, we've won. We've already won. And, and it throws Davy for a loop. But warfare is a major element in the book. And one of the great lines that comes from this, Jeremiah Land tells his children, he says, children, we and the world will always be at war. Retreat is impossible. Arm yourselves. Another theme is that of prayer. Many times we see Jeremiah Land praying and receiving answers to questions or answers to his prayers. Good versus evil. The clean division of the world into good guys and bad guys from a child's perspective that we see in Reuben. Reuben sees the world as good and evil. And then he shows it. And then as he grows older, he sees that, it, that reality is more nuanced than that. That people he thought were bad might not be as bad as he thought. And people he thought were good might not be as good as he thought. And there's different ways to look at it. So he grows up. That's part of the maturity that he sees. There's still good and evil. And, and Jape Walters is the embodiment of evil. But he learns to say, well, I don't know everything. And I need to, be a, I need to pay attention to what's going on. 
And then there's real evil. There are some very evil people in this book, like Jabe Walters. But one of the major aspects of this um, book is the nature of faith. It's really the central theme. What does it mean to believe? What is faith? What is faith based upon? Um, the miracles that Reuben's father, Jeremiah Land, performs or is the conduit for, however you want to say it, they, prov they present issues of faith, the relationship between miracles and faith. Um, it leads to certain questions. For instance, what is a miracle and what is their purpose? As Christians, we believe in miracles. Now, some Christians say that miracles have stopped and there are no miracles. Other Christians say things like, I live, I need a miracle every day and it's a miracle. Uh, and to say when you get up in the morning and you wake up and the sun's shining, yeah, that's a miracle. That's really not what the Bible calls a miracle. But then there are other people who talk about miracles and they pray for miracles. And if you send a certain amount of monies, it'll guarantee a miracle. Those, that's more like magic. So it's, it's not biblical to say that the sun shining and the sp and spring coming and the trees blossoming is a miracle. That's not biblical. But it's also not biblical to talk about miracles in the sense of I can control these things. I can make these happen by doing these certain things, praying this certain prayer, um, giving this amount of money, whatever you want to call it. That's magic. So there's a difference between the normal operation of the world that God has set up and then there's magic. Miracles somehow are not in either of those categories. What's the purpose of a miracle? Is it just make me happy? Or is the purpose to glorify God or somehow point to him? And do miracles happen today? Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. As a Christian, I believe in miracles and I think they do happen. They're answers to prayer. If you want to call that a miracle, that's fine. I don't know if the Bible would call an answer to prayer a miracle. Usually a miracle is something that's out of the ordinary, that has, that stops, comes up, makes you stop and say, how did that happen? Now, there are different coincidences, and other things that happen. Those seem to be almost miraculous, but, and, but so it's a, it's hard to say, are those miracles? And then is there a difference between a sign and a miracle in the Bible? If we look at John chapter two, there are, there are references to signs. Jesus, when he changed the water into wine at the wedding at Canaan, John says, this is the first sign that Jesus did. Sign is not the same word as miracles. And John points out that there are seven signs in his gospel and they're separate from miracles but they're miraculous. So a sign and miracles, they kind of overlap, but they're not quite the same thing. And then what is the relationship between miracles and faith? People would say, well, I would believe in God if I saw a miracle. If I saw something that couldn't be explained, I believe in God. And that's not true. That's a lie. Um, look at the people, look at the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They lived through the 10 plagues. They saw all these signs. They get to the Red Sea, the Red Sea parts, they cross over. Pharaoh's army is destroyed, all for them. And what's the first thing they do when they get to the other side? Where's something to eat? Where's something to drink? God's not with us. You brought us out here to die in the wilderness. We don't believe you. Faith and miracles, miracles did not produce faith in the Israelites. And miracles don't produce faith in us. And the discussion of miracles in the book is quite profound because Reuben, the, the little boy, the hero of the book, he says his goal, his job is to bear witness to the miracles. But then he says miracles are dangerous because miracles change you, whether you believe in them or not, they change you. If you see a miracle and then you deny it, think of the Pharisees and the Gospels. If you see a miracle and you deny it, you are changed. Your heart is hardened. You take a position that you have to live with and bear the consequences thereof. At the same time, if you see a miracle and you believe and you have true faith, you're changed as well as that. 
So miracles are not these nice little things. Oh, I need a miracle at this point. Oh, I hope I get a miracle. Miracles are dangerous. Miracles present a challenge. And Reuben sees his job as bearing witness to his father's, the miracles that occur through his father. And that is one of the aspects of the book. Reuben's older brother, Davy, does not believe. His heart is hardened. That's why he takes matters into his own hand and kills the ruffians that attack Swede. He doesn't want to fight like his father fights. He wants to fight the way he wants to fight. And that means shooting the guys. He doesn't believe in miracles. He believes in bullets, strength, fighting. And that's the difference there. And that's one of the aspects of the book. All right. And what is the relationship between faith and see? Do I have to see something in order to believe it? The Bible indicates that faith is something that is unseen. It's, you have to have faith in something that is unseen. Because who would, who would need to have faith to believe in something you see? And yet, God does present us with things that we see. The miracle, <laughs> excuse me, the changing of the seasons, uh, changing of people's lives. These are things that we can see. Are they necessary for faith? Are they antithetical toward faith? Do they have some kind of relationship between faith and our seeing? Those are the issues that this book brings up. All right, so in conclusion then, Peace Like a River is a heroic journey story, but it's also a story about grace. Reuben Land begins his travel into the unknown, the Badlands, as a boy. He's very much a boy. Faces evil and death. Jape Walters, his asthma, he's, his asthma is getting worse as the story progresses. There's one point where he sees his asthma as this little guy, kind of golem creature that has a bag and takes his breath away. I don't know if you've ever had asthma before. When I was a little boy, I had a little bout of asthma one day, one time, and it frightened me a lot. You're trying to breathe and somehow your lungs, which worked fine yesterday, just are not working and it's bad it's scary and he returns from the dead as a new man you'll read that in the story too but he does all of this with his family he's not alone and that's one of the differences between anger's story and the archetype the hero is not alone he's with his family and he doesn't achieve these things through any strength of his through any wisdom that he has they're simply gifts they're gifts of grace that he receives and so Reuben, Reuben is a hero, but he's a hero who receives simply by grace. And it's, it's, a, it's a very sweetness of the story that I, I really appreciate. And his calling is to bear witness. And sometimes that bearing witness is simply by breathing. At the end of the book, he's cured of his asthma. And how he gets cured, well, we'll have to read the book and find out. All right, so I hope you enjoy this book, and we will be talking about it throughout the rest of the next month or so until we finish school at somehow, some way. All right. Thank you very much. And please look at the assignment sheet to see what I want you to do this week. Thank you.